So it is truly great to be with you this afternoon um, for a little bit to share the work that continues in Liberty Public Schools. We've not put pause or we've not stopped, we've not halted. If anything, um, things have gotten a little crazier um, in respect to the last several months. I want to begin and we'll talk a little bit uh, this morning or this afternoon about three areas. The first of which is just to give you a little bit of an overview of our district and then rolling into strategic plan and what that looks like for us even during a period of pandemic followed by facilities update as well as a little bit of return to learn and what this school year could potentially look like as we try to frame this up entering into really the unknown um, and challenges that lie ahead we've spent this last week talking to our buildings welcoming our teachers back um, both veteran teachers as well as new teachers to our system and one of the things that we have shared with them is that there are probably more questions in front of us than answers we've provided uh, since March. And so we know that, we've accepted that, we've accepted working through volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous situations, as have all of you in your respective fields, your respective professions, and leading staff, leading employees uh, in the work that you do. I honestly believe we could not be where we are at today collectively if not for this, if not for community. Um, I hope you've experienced that. I hope you've sensed that over the course of the last several months, particularly as we come back together face to face, even behind a mask at times, and have an increased appreciation one for another. <clears throat> With that said, we'll walk you through a couple pieces. Our Board of Education, we want to begin there in recognizing them for the work that they do. Um, we have a seven member board. We actually held on our board governance as far as an election in April. We did not have an election in April scheduled uh, because we had the equivalent number of incumbents that signed up for positions. Typically in April, we reshuffle our board leadership as far as president and vice president. We put that on pause during this period of pandemic, stayed with our president and vice president most recently, um, opened that back up as things begin to ease up a little bit during the summer and want to recognize Kim Marie Graham. Many of you know Kim Marie. Um, she's been appointed as the new board president for the district, as well as vice president, and that is Mr. Nick Bartlow, who is fulfilling that role. We actually end up with about four individuals on our board that have held those respective roles over the years. So there's a tremendous amount of leadership um, experience as it relates to board service. And so we appreciate our board of education um, for everything that they do for our students, as well as our community. This conveys just a few snapshots as far as our data as it relates to the composition of the district. Um, this is a little dated and I'll tell you why here briefly. This is where we ended the school year. Just under 13,000 students pre-K through grades 12. And we'll walk through that kind of deconstruction of those numbers here in just a moment. 19 campuses, we cover about 85 square miles within the school district's footprint. Students come to us from Kansas City, from Liberty, Kearney, Glen Eyre. Um, other small kind of pockets in and around Clay County, um, whether it be Missouri City, Excelsior Springs, kind of other areas. But where we draw the majority of our students from is about 45% from the Liberty side, 54% from the Kansas City side. Just about seven or eight years ago, that particular statistic was flipped. And so we've seen additional residences increase on the Kansas City side, thus the increase in our population there. Similarly, though, we're seeing more growth as far as construction and residences on the Liberty side. So we continue to monitor that and we'll share a little bit about that in just a moment. Additionally, under 2000 staff that make up our system. And so if you think about the fourth quarter and shutting down schools, not only were we sending nearly 13,000 students home to learn remotely, but we were also thinking through what it looks like to send 1800 employees home to be able to do their respective roles remotely as well. Um, so certainly a challenge, but yet something that our entire community is be, to be commended about. Graduation rate sits at 94%. Um, in addition, we sit at right about 20% free and reduced lunch, as well as a 20% socioeconomic um, ethnic breakup in terms of our diverse population or our diverse students. So 20% is kind of that key number that we'll hit on a little bit over the course of uh, this presentation this afternoon. To deconstruct our numbers a little bit, people are always interested to see this by building and where we fall. Um, so as we take a look at our high schools, for example, at our high schools, 2025, 1932, respectively, if you've been following along or you have students that are school age, 
you'll know that this creates a challenge right here as you look at each building in terms of trying to physically distance, right? So one of the things that we did as soon as we closed schools back in the uh, fourth quarter was start shifting to reopening and what that could potentially look like. We started surveying our families early on and trying to get a sense for them, even in April and May, June, July, what their appetite was or interest was in returning face to face versus having their children learn virtually over the course of this coming school year. And where we landed was that we would anticipate anywhere from 15, 10 to 15% was the figure that we looked at back in May and June. And then that number started to grow a little bit to where today, as you look at it by building, this isn't reflected up here, but that range from building to building is anywhere from 20 to 27, 28%. The district average is about 20% of our students at every single campus are electing to go virtually solely as compared to the remaining roughly 80% that are electing to go back face to face. And we'll hit on that a little bit as we move forward. One of the critical pieces that we're looking at right now is as we transition back to a fall learning environment or school opening up, one of the questions would be how many do we recapture, perhaps from homeschool populations that are looking at our virtual option, but then similar, how, similarly, how many are leaving the system for other choices, whether they're moving to a new area or whether they're just looking for a different educational option for their children and their family. So as we move forward, one of the things that we wanted to speak to, and we've shared this a little bit, but this is really something that's relatively new. I think last time we were together with the chamber, we were just wrapping up our strategic planning process. And one of the things that we set out to do about a year ago was to really rethink our strategic planning approach and rather than it being a five or 10 year fixed plan, really moving that to being more flexible and more agile, which in hindsight has proven incredibly helpful as we started talking about how to adjust and change and flex and pivot, insert your keyword there, um, that you're using in your company or your place of employment. And what that's done for us is really begin shifting our mindsets to everything that we just experienced over the course of the last five months, as well as where we're headed in the coming school year. So we'll speak a little bit about that strategic planning process. One of the key components of it though, was how might we create an agile strategic plan in which every single individual within our system, within our community thrives. And we think that we do that through equity. That logo that's up at the very top, that Thrive logo and the one that you saw as the opener, I uh, want to credit Guild Content. I think they were mentioned earlier. They helped put some graphics together for us. The reason why we landed on that was that I would hope that every single one of us in this room, young, old, black, white, rich, poor, middle class, whatever uh, strata you come from, my hope would be that every single one of us wants our family, our community, to thrive personally, professionally, in the future, in the present, during a pandemic, you name it. So my hope is that we can latch onto that and really unpack that in what it means for every single one of our students, nearly 13,000, nearly 2,000 staff, but then also broader, broader than that, every single one of us within our Liberty uh, community. I was gonna show this, but then she said not to. Um, so I'm showing it anyway, but it's actually, a, <laughs> There's actually a video that's tied to this. And I wanna pause here for a second. We couldn't figure out the audio, but this is available on our website. And we teed this up with our Board of Education and we've shown it in other presentations. But I wanna thank you all, first and foremost, for two things. Many of you, even during that period of a pandemic, stayed in contact with students. Whether it was a student that was doing a shadowship or that was doing an internship, you continued to engage and you didn't just sit, throw up your hands and say, hey, we're done, we can't do this during a pandemic, but instead you started thinking creatively about how to continue to engage your students um, that were working with you. The other thing I wanna thank you for is that many of you over the course of the last couple of weeks reached out to teachers, um, intentionally or not, by way of our vendor fair. This time of year, we usually do a large convocation. We welcome businesses in to connect with our employees, share a little bit about what you do and the services that you can provide, the products that you can provide. Um, we wanted to continue that this fall, but at the same time, we knew it couldn't happen face to face. And so we just completed that virtual event last week, and it has been incredibly well received um, by our Liberty Public School staff. If anything, it's a little glimpse of normalcy um, because they're used to seeing that, they're used to engaging with you all and your entities, your companies, 
um, every single year. So thank you to Colleen for working on both of those fronts, engaging businesses within our district, but at the same time, pushing kids out into your spaces so that they can learn invaluable skills and dispositions that will assist them later on in life. So we're gonna skip the video, but I do want to jump into those dispositions. One of the first pieces tied to the strategic plan work is really a graduate profile. <clears throat> so we spent some time surveying families, surveying businesses, surveying community, in and around what are those skills and dispositions that you believe our Liberty Public Schools graduates should possess as they walk across and receive their diploma. We not only want that piece of paper in their hand, but we want them to be equipped with these skills and dispositions for success in whatever they pursue. So if you've not seen this, this is something that we're building upon. It was one thing to identify those skills and dispositions. It's even more difficult to be able to think through how do we instill these within every single one of our kiddos. And it's not just for our high school kids because it begins at a much earlier age. It starts in pre-K, grows to elementary, middle level, so that by the time they're in high school, they will have had exposure to skills and dispositions in the areas of academic, cultural, personal, professional, and entrepreneurial. So each of those is defined within this chart, but then similarly, you can see kind of the key words beneath each definition. So under professional, it's collaborative, effective communicator, self-directed, resourceful, dependable. Under entrepreneurial, creative, values networks, strategic, adaptable, perseveres. Those are those skills and dispositions that we want for our students. Over the course of the last five months, Knowingly or unknowingly, students probably hit every single one of those skills, skills and dispositions. You have probably hit every single one of those skills and dispositions. Um, innately or intuitively, whatever you want to call it, but at the same time, how can we be intentional about ensuring that those skills and dispositions are in place for every single one of our students? We do that through real world learning opportunities in partnership with our community. Our strategic plan then focuses on these key areas, obviously teaching, learning, professional growth, leadership, community. We finalized this back in September. We worked the plan and one of the key components within that strategic plan was actually how we approach virtual learning. And we did one thing on one day that set us up for the month of March and that was approaching snow days differently. That may not seem like it's a monumental feat, but nonetheless, it prepared us for what was to come. And so we had worked to put plans in place to have virtual snow days and what that would look like. We were ready in November to initiate that in the event that we needed to. We used it one time, but when we shifted just prior to spring break and went virtual and remotely, guess what? Our staff kind of knew what that looked like, even though it was one day. Our students kind of knew what that looked like, our parents also knew what that looked like. And so it doesn't sound like it's that significant, but if not have been, having folded that into our strategic plan, we would have been that much further behind in readying ourselves for shutting down our classrooms and our schools during the course of the fourth quarter. What we learned since then, a lot of districts were not positioned for that. A lot of districts did not have the technology or the infrastructure, which has shown more inequities across the state of Missouri um, that we need to work through. Nonetheless, that springboarded us to the fourth quarter that then has led us into planning for this coming school year and opening this fall semester. So our strategic plan has 22 specific areas of focus um, within those five broader categories um, that we shared as far as teaching, learning, professional development, leadership, community. To give you a little more sense of the specifics that those plans involve, you can see those listed off to the right. Whether it's competency-based approaches, whether it's professional growth, professional learning, whether it's equity, whether it's real-world learning, as you see there in the middle, accentuating some of those skills and dispositions on our graduate profile through the four C's, all the way down to that community engagement, public relations, marketing piece. This is what we landed on. I will say this today, as we are revisiting, as we are reassessing and reprioritizing, we're gonna shuffle the deck because we've realized mainly due to a pandemic, that some of these are pertinent, but then some of these uh, really, that was not the direct course at that time, or we've had to shift um, because of what we've experienced since March. We're gonna continue to work through this with our Board of Education um, as we plan to move ahead. The other thing that that has caused us to do as we think about a graduate profile, and as we think about a different way of strategic planning, 
it's caused us to reassess how we measure our progress, metrics specifically. And so what we've done is we've moved away from some of those traditional standardized assessment metrics to really thinking about how we can elevate the academic, focus on the social emotional piece as well because that's critically important. And if anything, we've emphasized that more or learned more about the importance of that since the pandemic. And then lastly, how do we shine a spotlight on real world learning experiences and opportunities for our kids? So if we think about measurement differently than what you or I experienced in school, yeah, the ACT score is important, the SAT score is important, we want to do well on all of those academic measures, but what we would consider these three categories, academic, social, emotional, and real world, we would call those uncommon measures. And so that's really what we're embarking upon. We've since hit pause on some of those academic pieces at the state level. The state level is now rethinking some of those as well. We've shared this information with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and advocated for a similar set of metrics as compared to a litmus test or, a po or an autopsy at the end of the year via a standardized test. I have some opinions on that. Um, <clears throat> in addition to that though, how do we measure social emotional? We have some measurement tools that we can utilize and we've used those during the course of the pandemic. And it really starts as simply as how are you doing? How are you managing? How are you doing with your family? How are you managing your stress load? How are you managing your workload? How are your relationships? Do you feel accepted? Those types of uh, questions, but sometimes we don't take the time to ask our youngest among us those questions. And so starting from an early age to middle and then on up into high school to be able to assess how students are doing and then set some goals as far as how we move the needle in, in some of those indicators that we see as a result of the data. The last piece that I want to share in terms of uh, metrics is really that real world learning piece. And we have worked with a lot of business partners. We've, we've worked with districts across uh, the region. We've worked with other groups like the Kauffman Foundation, a group uh, nationally known as Getting Smart, and how we can increase the number of real world learning experiences that our students access. Whether it's an internship, a shadow ship, whether it's um, dual credit experiences, perhaps it's an entrepreneurial experience or an apprenticeship, um, career, uh, career uh, experiences, early college access, whatever those look like, what is that plus one experience that every single one of our students possesses? So they not only receive their diploma, they're not only equipped with those skills and dispositions to be successful, but they have a bridge that leads them to post-secondary in that real-world learning experience. So we were talking earlier with someone whose daughter, uh, this was this morning in a meeting, um, her daughter had an internship as a speech-language pathologist intern. Lo and behold, she started at K-State this week, and that's her pursuit. If not for being involved in that in our Liberty Public Schools community, um, who knows what she would be doing as she pursues uh, a four-year degree. So we want to plant that seed early and bridge that to whatever experience lands beyond high school. So take all of that, throw in a pandemic, and then that's where we're at today. Uh, so how do we return um, to open up a school year and begin 2020-2021 uh, academic year? No one's ever done that in a pandemic that I'm aware of, except for maybe in the early 1900s with the Spanish flu. And so what we embarked on was trying to capture as much resources as we possibly can via our district's website. So you can visit our website and you can see all of the different plans that we've put in place since March. And really the best way of explaining this, it's kind of like writing a book. You don't just show up and the book's written. You write one chapter after the other, after the other, after the other. We were on a call with the governor back in early April and he was deciding on whether or not to close schools. And as he made that decision, we chimed in and we said, you know, Mr. Governor, it's going to be equally difficult on how we reopen schools and get ready for the fall than it is how we shut down schools in the state of Missouri. And that has proven to be the case. And so if you deconstruct our story over the last five months, it starts with that decision to close schools in collaboration with the governor and, and districts across the state. It then comes to how do we bring kids and, students and teachers back together to close out a school year? How do we start a summer virtual program as far as virtual summer school in the month of June? How do we bring student athletes and fine arts participation uh, participants back um, to access their coaches and sponsors and activities that they love? How do we do a face-to-face -face summer school in the month of July? How do we build a return to learn plan and get that across the board for their approval on July 14th? 
only to be wrong July 15th. How do we return to learn as far as open our schools? So each of those is a subsequent chapter as we move forward in trying to get to September 8th and how we're able to welcome kids back both face-to-face -face as well as virtually. So if you stop and think about it, 80% of our kids coming to us face-to-face -face at the elementary five days a week, at the middle school and high school level, a hybrid approach as far as two days a week, we have to staff both. And so moving of staff around and trying to accommodate individual student needs and we're truly working with every single family and every request that comes forward to try to meet those needs. And so far, I think we're doing pretty well in trying to customize that experience moving forward for our kiddos. There are a plethora of resources on our district's page. If you're a parent, you hopefully have seen these. If you've not, check it out. Uh, but they range from what are all those pieces that we've talked about as far as some of those chapters, the health precautions, the, the guidance that we're receiving from health departments, from the Center for Disease Control, um, working through all of that to put those plans in place. It culminates in this document that we've pushed forward. And as it captures up here on the journey together, it walks you through that reentry to the summer school piece, to the activities, the return to work, opening our facilities up for uh, churches and others that need access to them um, as we go forward. This graphic right here, this blue box, is critically important because even during a period of a pandemic, we were focused on continuous improvement. And what it points out to, I believe this is the number of surveys that were conducted, uh, the 6,000 in addition to focus groups, in addition to clicks on our webpage, um, and trying to push information out as we move forward just to try to stay in front of uh, so people are aware. We also put in place a Let's Talk portal, uh, which I don't know if that showed up on the previous slide, um, but if you go to our webpage, that yellow bar on the far right, we put that in place April 1st. Ironically, the joke was on us because we got inundated with questions, uh, but that's really what we wanted. It sends the question that you pose to the direct person that has the answer for you, hopefully. Um, and if not, that person runs point on responding to you. We've literally had thousands upon thousands of inquiries from students, from staff, from family, from community, and we're working at our response time to try to turn that around efficiently so that no question is left undone. Tremendous amount of lift on our team, but nonetheless, I think that's proven beneficial um, as we think about communication during a period of pandemic. This is the example of our hybrid approach um, for our secondary students for middle school and high school. Again, if you have a kiddo, you're probably familiar with this, but what we've been pushed into having to do really um, in working collaboratively with the health department is a modified approach. So if your kiddo is uh, in groups one or two and it's alphabetized, you come on an A day or a B day. So group one or group A on Monday, maybe face to face, Group two would be virtual, and then it's flipped on, a, on that next Tuesday. Wednesday, everybody is virtual. We allow for some virtual office hours for our staff and that they can triage with kiddos that need assistance along the way. And then you repeat that on Thursday and Friday. Over the course of the year, we'll continue to work this until we're given the all clear to slowly move back into fully face-to-face, -face, hopefully five days a week. Um, but we'll have to monitor that as we move forward in terms of our positivity rates and other triggers um, in respect to how we're doing as a community. Shifting then to another topic that's always of interest to people, our construction projects continue. Back in March, we had a big question mark on that as it relates to construction. And we were wondering how long we could go in continuing to keep on track with our construction projects. And honestly, we've not missed a beat. We have been able to continue that. We had some concerns around supplies as far as construction supplies or various items that we would need to complete those projects. For the most part, those have stayed on track as well. A couple of items that you may or may not have monitored or seen. Um, these are completed spaces for the most part, ranging from the early childhood center and an entrance there um, to Lillian Schumacher in the center top over to the right, Manor Hill and reconfiguring their secure entrance there. Restrooms our key for middle school kids. So Heritage Middle School had some renovation and some restrooms as well as some high school uh, changes. Um, this is the additional wing or the extension of a wing at Franklin Elementary with a flexible learning space. Over here you have Shoal Creek and then that second entrance up here is at Liberty Middle School in a, in a more welcoming uh, entrance into their office space and then some renovations at Lewis and Clark Library. 
So those construction projects continue. The two major ones sit at Liberty North High School as well as Liberty High School. And really finishing up our academic wing at Liberty North, this really finishes out that space as far as kind of their, their physical space. Um, you have classrooms, but then you also have some flexible learning environments as it relates to this first floor and the second floor. Um, and that space is completed. We've actually com totally completed that construction at Liberty North High School um, early spring in and around that time frame. The next area is Liberty High School then. If this one may be off-site. It may not be on your radar very much. So we've got a lot of construction happening at Liberty High School, renovating the front entrance because of some leaks that we've had from over the years, um, needing a facelift there. On the back of the building, this is the Performing Arts Center, and it is nearly completed as well. In fact, the classroom spaces um, are all completed with the exception of the actual auditorium. And so we have had a little bit of a backlog on seating that's coming in that it's expected to be done by early October and being able to utilize that space, a little social distancing in the theater, um, being a little creative on how we pull off fine arts productions, but nonetheless, we've been able to do some of that even during the course of the summer. So that space is nearly completed, it's entirely enclosed, and so we look forward to welcoming students to that space as well. To transition and to wrap up before I take your questions, um, this leads us into the next kind of wave of what we expect in terms of the district. We continue to grow, we know that, but at the same time we're finalizing our facilities master plan and projects that are community approved on our last bond issue, our last no tax issue bond issue. And so then as those construction projects wrap up, then we go back to the drawing board, even during a period of pandemic, starting with looking at our debt analysis and debt service and how we are positioned to move forward, either in paying off debt earlier or building capacity for another no tax issue bond issue. The demographic projections, we were on track to finalize that in early spring. That has been put on hold. We're looking at bringing that back forward, sharing that information with the City of Liberty, the City of Kansas City, working in partnership with them. And then that takes us into facility master planning as well as finalizing projects and priorities for the district as we move forward. There are some questions, uncertainties in terms of what's the impact of the pandemic on the community, then also on our needs moving forward, our student population and so forth. So we feel as though we're in a good position now, uh, but continuing to watch what's happening in the economy, continuing to watch what's happening with our demographics, um, and then also moving forward as to what our needs are across the system. So thank you for walking this journey with us over the course of the last several months. For many of you that have been long-term members of our community, You've seen the progress, the, the highs, the lows, the struggles, the challenges. Um, we're plowing ahead even during a period of a pandemic and working to try to support nearly 13,000 learners across Liberty Public Schools. So thanks for the time to be here this afternoon with you.